we're all talking about this book, um, at some stage we need to give a, an account of what it's about. We can't assume that everybody read it from cover to cover last night or, um, and there'll be many, I gather some graduate students who are tuning in who perhaps haven't read this book. So I thought what I'll try and do is for the most part, talk about the main, what I take to be the main threads of this project. And if I've got some time, I'll say a little bit about how I think this ties into some of the modern debates, uh, more recent debates about explanation in mathematics. Okay, so starting with uh, the indispensability argument, and I should say what I'm going to do is try and articulate the views that Hartree puts forward in the first edition of this book. Um, he, he adds quite a bit to a really interesting new introduction to the second edition. And uh, I know his views have changed a little bit on some of these things over the years. And perhaps he can say a little bit more about that in his comments, but I'm gonna, for the most part, focus on Hartree Field's views in the original Science Without Numbers and that original Science Without Numbers project. Um, so the starting point I take it is the indispensability argument going back to Quine and the general Quinean framework for doing metaphysics. So the way I like to lay the argument out is as follows, we ought to have ontological commitment to all and only those entities that are indispensable to our best scientific theories. Then premise two, mathematical entities are indispensable to our best scientific theories. Conclusion, surprise, surprise, we ought to have ontological commitment to mathematical entities. And modulo some worries about the modality of ought in this. I take it that the argument is valid. So really the two camps in resisting this argument are denying premise one, denying premise two. And uh, Hartree takes what I've called the hard road, which is to deny premise two. So try and show that mathematical entities are in fact dispensable to our best scientific theories. Much of the recent work, which others will talk about, Mary, for instance, has explored rejecting premise one. Uh, easy road is not supposed to be pejorative in the sense that it's easy to do that. It just seems easier than the normalization project that I'll articulate shortly that Hartree engages in. Okay, uh, so, just a couple of comments about what it is to be indispensable. This is my own take on this, but I, I, I think Hartree agrees with this. Uh, I, I sort of extracted this from his work in Science Without Numbers and elsewhere. So the first thing you have to say is it can't be just not eliminable. You know, to be indispensable is not in, ineliminable. I won't go into the details. Hartree does this very nicely in Science Without Numbers, discussion of Craig's theorem. There's a sense in which you know, provided you can divide a language up in a certain way, any entity is dispensable, is, if that's what you mean by dispensable. It can be eliminated from the, the, the language, the scientific language. So that's not what we mean because we want to be able to say something special about mathematical entities. So my take on this is that an entity is dispensable to a theory if the following two conditions hold. There exists a modification of that theory some other theory, T prime, with exactly the same observable consequences as the original theory, and that the entity in question is neither mentioned nor predicted by the new theory. Um, and moreover, that T prime is better than T. Must be some reason for adopting the new theory and is indispensable otherwise. So in short, to demonstrate the dispensability, we need an attractive alternative theory. And that I take it is the core motivation for science without numbers. Going back to the indispensability argument here, Hartree wants to show that mathematical entities are indispensable, so mathematical entities are dispensable in fact, to our best scientific theories. And to do that, he needs to construct an alternative science as it were, but, but he focuses as we'll see, particularly on one scientific theory to show how you would go about doing this. If you can provide an alternative, a mathematics free alternative, then um, you're, you're, you're good to go. So Fields 
nominalism is motivated by three things. Um, Benafsaraf's epistemic challenge to Platonism. This should be fairly familiar to most people. If you're a Platonist, you believe in these abstract mathematical entities that do not have space-time locations, don't have causal powers. How is it that we have knowledge of them? Um, but Hartree is very careful to lay out that this is not the reason. This is the reason many people are anomalous to think, okay, there's this just completely uh, knockdown argument against Platonism or as close to a knockdown argument as you get in philosophy that they just cannot provide a, an epistemology. Hartree says this is a problem and is a reason to explore other alternatives, but it's not the, uh, the reason to be anomalous. So that's a motivation, but, but mere motivation, I take it. There's the desire to provide intrinsic explanations, and I'll say a little bit more about that in due course. So the, the rough idea here is that if you've got this scientific theory that say about electrons, and you've got all this mathematical apparatus in the theory as well, the theory at the end of the day is about electrons. So the explanation should be in terms of electrons, not in terms of mathematical entities or whatever's going on in set theory. But the idea is that these intrinsic explanations should be explanations about the things that you, the theory is about, intrinsic to the theory. And so that's a, a large motivation. And I, I think it's fair to say a lot of us in philosophy of mathematics, or maybe I should just speak for myself here, have overlooked the importance of this in Hartree's thinking here. Um, a great deal of the discussion has been on other things, but this is, this is I think, having reread the book recently, this is front and center in Hartree's thinking about the particular project and why he takes the path that he does. And thirdly, the elimination of arbitrariness. So again, just a quick example. If you have a, a, a space-time theory that is a has coordinates there's arbitrariness about the coordinates right you could have chosen zero to be somewhere else you could have chosen different scales there's something arbitrary about any coordinate system so coordinate free formulations of geometry are to be preferred because they don't have that arbitrariness and that again is kind of motivation in Hartree's approach in science without numbers so as i said subsequent debate focused mostly on the first of these the Banasarath challenge and the problems, well-known problems for Platonism, difficulties for nominalism, fictionalism and the like. And, um, but I, I've always found it interesting that explanation was right there from the get-go in Hartree's thinking. So the second point, dot point above under his motivation, the desire to provide intrinsic explanations. So he was thinking in terms of explanation right from the start. And that was one of the prime motivations for the Science Without Numbers project. So Science Without Numbers sets out to provide an attractive alternative mathematics-free science. It provides a nominalistic version of the differential fragment of Newtonian gravitational theory. Of course, this is well short of nominalizing all of science, which is what you would need to do to actually undermine the second premise of the indispensability argument. But to be fair here, it's much further than anyone thought was possible before Science Without Numbers was written you know, to show that you can do a serious piece of science like Newtonian gravitational theory, or at least the differential fragment. He didn't do the integral fragment, but, but the differential fragment of, of Newtonian gravitational theory and to show how you can do that without mathematics, I, I think in itself is a major achievement. So the idea is that once you see how to nominalize this fragment of a serious scientific theory, the path is open for future work. So I don't think that um, Hartree or anyone else thought that the job was done once you've finished reading Science Without Numbers, but rather you've got a, you've got a roadmap of how to flesh out this hard road to nominalism. Um, There are some problems here with various other kinds of theories, but again, you might think that, well, it's Newtonian mechanics, it's not relativity theory. 
not special relativity that's going to be different, but it's still a space-time theory. And I'll, I'll, when I get to the details of how you go about this, this move to normalize a space-time theory, it's not too implausible to see how it will work for special relativity and even general relativity where you've got um, curved space-time manifolds. As long as you've got this space-time structure, something like the Hartree field project is, is likely to work. Again, the details need to be spelled out and Hartree's in science without numbers is not making any claims that, you know, the hard bit's done, uh, you know, and, and so on and so on for general relativity. That needs to be done, of course, but uh, it's a sketch of how you go about doing it. So let me just say a little bit, I'm not gonna go into too much of the technical details here. Um, for those of you, you know, who are familiar with this stuff, you will know it uh, you know, better than I probably. Uh, this is mainly for those who have not encountered the, the Science Without Numbers project before. I just wanna say a few words about the technical details. So we start with Hilbert's axiomatization of Euclidean geometry. So what Hilbert does here is replace the usual um, formulation of Euclidean geometry with a metric by looking at just relational properties between points. So we start with a three, three place between relation. And this is a primitive relation in the theory. So we read where Y is between X and Z is written Y bet X Z. And intuitively that this is not part of the theory, intuitively you understand this to mean that X is a point on the line segment with endpoints Y and Z, right? That's sort of the, the intuitive understanding of that. But I stress that that's not part of the Hilbert um, story. It's a, a primitive relation Y bet X Z. And, but it's going to do the job of what we normally think of as a Euclidean geometry as X is the point on the line segment between Y and Z. And then the four place segment congruence relation um, where X and Y are congruent to Z and W is written X, Y, Kong, Z, W. Again, a primitive relation in the Hilbert axiomatization Again, just intuitive to get a grip on this, intuitive understanding of this is to mean that the distance from point X to Y is the same as the distance from point Z to point W. Okay, but there's no, I stress again, there's no metric in this formulation of Euclidean geometry. So this intuitive understanding is just a way of kind of reading this, but that's not in the theory. It's going to play the same kind of role as these claims, like the intuitive understanding turns out that that's what this four place segment congruence relation does for us. But notice that there's no mention of a metric here or distance. We don't have to talk about distances. We can just compare points with respect to their uh, uh, um, various geometric properties without talking about distance. That's the core idea. You're looking at relational properties amongst points in the space time rather than measuring the distances between them. So that's the, 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 the basics of the Hilbert project. Then what you can do is prove that for any model of Hilbert's axiom system for some space S, you can you can read that for yourself. The basic idea here is you can prove this representation theorem, right? You can prove that anything, as long as your axiom system obey, your space time obeys these axioms. So you've got this congruence relation, this between relation, you can recover the information in the meta theory about distance and distance behaves the way that it ought to do, right? Uh, so take point A there, for any four points, X, Y, Z, and W, X, Y is congruent to Z, W, if and only if the distance between X and Y is the same as the distance between Z and W, right? So this meta theorem, this representation theorem, 
it uh, validates that intuitive reading that I gave on the previous slide, right? So I said the intuitive reading of the, what the between relation, the segment congruence is, if you're allowed to talk about distances, that's validated by this representation theorem. So any Euclidean theorem about length would be true if it was restated as a theorem about any function D satisfying the conditions of the theorem. And so in this way, you can replace quantification over numbers with quantification over points. That's the, that's the crucial trick. And by trick, I don't mean to trivialize it. It's a, it's a, a, a really um, brilliant idea. Uh, Hilbert also proved a corresponding uniqueness theorem that if there are two functions, D1, D2 satisfying the conditions above, then um, D1 equals KD2 where K is an arbitrary positive constant. So you've got, as you would expect, um, the distance function doesn't have a privileged unit, but it uh, works as a, 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 as a metric. But the, again, just reiterating, the metric is something that you can recover via this representation theorem. The axiomatization does not need a metric. And that's the kind of crucial idea, right? You can, you can give an account of Euclidean geometry without talking about triangle inequalities, for instance. You don't need a metric. You can say everything that you want to say in terms of this congruence and between relation, and you can prove that that's all you, you can recover all of this information because of the representation theorem. Okay. Now, I won't say too much more about that that's the Hilbert project that Hartree piggybacks his science without numbers on. And if you appreciate the sort of core insight there, you can see how science without numbers is now going to proceed, right? And I, I, again, I won't go through the details, but what you need to do is add to the geometry of Euclidean space some information about gravitational potentials um, and mass densities and so on. You've got to have these extra concepts that appear in Newtonian mechanics, mass, gravitational potential, that don't appear in plain old ordinary Euclidean geometry. So the space is going to be the same. So you're going to have Euclidean space, but now with these gravitational potential functions and the mass density functions. And what Hartree does here is just use this Hilbert trick again. So instead of talking about the gravitational potential at a point being such and such, you compare points with respect to their gravitational potential. So you can say things like there's the, the gravitational potential at some point is greater than it is at some other point, but you don't have to actually talk about the figure. The, the, so you don't need a mass density function or a gravitational potential function, you just do it with these comparative predicates. In exactly the same way as Hilbert did it without the metric, without talking about distance, you just compare points with respect to their spatial, spatial lo location properties. Uh, in Hartree's version of Newtonian mechanics, you don't need a, a gravitational potential function you do it by these relational properties, just comparing points with respect to gravitational potential, with respect to their mass density and so on. And then, again, a lot of technical details there. I'm not, I haven't got time to go through all of that, but I think once you see the Hilbert style axiomatization of Euclidean geometry, you get the idea of how this has got to be done. And, Hartree does it in great detail and very carefully in science without numbers, but I'm just going to give a sketch of the idea of the project here. So once you've done that, um, you've spelled out how to formulate a Newtonian mechanics without appealing to functions like gravitational potential functions. Then what you do is you can spell out a representation theorem. And again, you can read that for yourself. It, 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 the details don't really matter here, but it's going to be very similar to the idea of the Hilbert project. You axiomatize space-time uh, with the uh, mass density function and a gravitational potential function. And you have intuitive understanding of the relational 
predicates that you're using in the theory itself. But then in the meta theory, you prove this representation theorem, which effectively says that anything you can say in good old fashioned garden variety in Newtonian mechanics, I can recover that and vice versa. So you can do everything that you could you you would want to do in Newtonian mechanics in this uh, relational version of Newtonian mechanics. And what's cool about that is that the relational version doesn't have any of the mathematical apparatus, right? It doesn't have the gravitational potential functions. You're just looking at points. And again, to stress why this is anomalist, right? Because it doesn't have the mathematical apparatus. But again, just a little bit about this notion of intrinsicality. And I know Eddie's going to talk much more about that tomorrow, so I don't want to steal Eddie's thunder. But just to try and get a grip on what this intrinsicality is here, it's, it's uh, the idea is that what you're interested in is the gravitational potential at various points. And so specifying that in terms of a gravitational potential function via mathematical apparatus, sort of in some sense obscures the fact that it's the points that have the gravitational potential. And what you really want to do is understand a gravitational theory in terms of the space time points themselves, not the mathematical representation of them and not functions over those, those uh, space times. So it's about the gravitational potential of the points. So explanations about why rocks fall off cliffs and the like is going to be about properties of the points themselves, not about gravitational potential functions. And that I take it is part of what it means to be an intrinsic explanation. Okay, so that's a very, very quick sketch of the normalization part of the project. There's a lot going on in Science Without Numbers for a, for a slim little volume, as Khatri notes in the second edition, he called it a monograph because he thought it was neither a book nor a paper, it was something in between. Um, but for a, a slim monograph, there's a lot, lot going on in this book. So that's the, a great deal of the book is taken up with the technical details of how to, how to do this and how to arrive at this representation theorem. I, I, I have not done justice to it here, but I do want to just uh, give a sketch of how this is supposed to go. Next is a question of, and I'm not sure Hartree would put it exactly like this, but here's my take on this. So you've, sh so you've shown us how to do science without numbers, but why should we? What's to be gained by doing this? Well, again, back to Hartree's original motivations, the intrinsic explanations is good, is good reason to do it this way. That's not a good reason to be anomalous because as he notes, anomalous don't have to like intrinsic explanations and intrinsic explanation people don't have to be anomalous. But, but what's nice about this particular way to normalism is that arguably it does give you intrinsic explanations. So that's one reason to do this particular, uh, to this, do it this particular way. Not to be anomalous in general, but why you should do it this particular way, you get these intrinsic explanations. That's a good thing. But there's this puzzle. If you, can, if you do science without numbers, and according to, just let's focus on Newtonian mechanics for the moment. You, let's suppose that Hartree has actually succeeded in showing us how to do Newtonian mechanics without mathematical apparatus. Question remains, why should you do that? Hartree is a fictionalist about mathematics. So mathematics is some kind of useful fiction that you can add to the story. But the, the, the real action is in the space-time points themselves and the, the, their relational gravitational potential predicates and the like. But the question then is, well, why didn't science go off the rails when it started introducing mathematics? After all, adding fictions to true, to story, true stories doesn't always lead to happy endings, right? Adding, um, you know, Trumpian fictionalism about what's going on in the world 
uh, doesn't change the the way COVID nineteen is actually is actually um, uh, carrying on, right? Adding fictions to real science typically ends badly. At least um, the results come in it will end badly for for one person in particular. But the the, the the idea that sort of adding some fiction to a tr to a true story is sh intuitively should screw up the true story. So why is it that adding this fiction of mathematics to science turns out to be a good thing to do? Right. So showing that you can do the science without mathematics is only the first step. Right. And again, Hartree recognizes this. Show that you can do science without numbers, all well and good, but then you still need to answer the question why is it that we can do science with numbers and not completely screw things up? So this brings us to the notion of conservativeness. So a mathematical theory M is said to be conservative if for any body of nominalistic assertions N and any particular nominalistic assertion phi, then phi is not a consequence of M plus N unless it's a consequence of N. That's not quite right. There's a, there's, you got to put some restrictions, but that that's it's clearer in that formulation what the basic idea is. And again, I get this from Hartree. He notes that if the nominalistic theory contains the assertion that there are no abstract objects, this doesn't turn out to be quite right. And you've got to reformulate it. But it, the reformulations actually cloud the central idea. So I'm going to stick with the with the basic idea of conservativeness here that that it's not quite right, but clearer. So the idea here is that adding this mathematical apparatus to your scientific theory doesn't give you any more new nominalistic exertions than you could have got directly from the nominalistic theory you started with. So think of it like this. You've got this nominalized science, sort of the, the Newtonian mechanics of science without numbers. Then you add calculus or whatever mathematics you require to that or you'd like, not require, because you've shown you don't require it, right, in some sense. But whatever mathematics you think will be convenient, say calculus, you add calculus to Hartree's version of, uh, of Newtonian mechanics, and you get predictions and uh, consequences out of that combined theory. But if you restrict the consequences and the like to nominalistically respectable consequences, those were derivable from the basic nominalistic theory that you started with. So it turns out that mathematics is an expedient way to get these consequences, but it doesn't give you anything new. It will give you new things, right? It will give you, once you add mathematics, you get things like there exists a continuous function, there, can, there exists a differentiable function and so on and so forth. You get all these consequences that comes out of the mathematics and maybe some mixed statements, like there exists a differentiable function that maps from the space-time manifold to the real numbers. You've got to get all of that stuff out, but that's not a purely nominalistic consequence. So if you restrict your consequences to the nominalistic consequences, if mathematics is conservative, you won't get anything out of the combined M plus N that you couldn't have got out of N on its own. I hope that's clear. Now, is mathematics conservative? That's, that would be a nice thing. And I think the, the case Hartree makes for this is a, this would be a very good thing for mathematics to be conservative in this sense. It, needs, it remains to be shown that it is in fact conservative. And again, just to get a sense of what conservativeness is, and this again comes from Hartree, I think even this diagram is from Hartree. He says in a couple of places, you can think of conservativeness as being like necessary truth, but without the truth, right? It's, it's more than consistency, but less than necessary truth, but it's not true. So that's a sort of relational diagram to show where conservativeness sits, sits in this. So if something's not consistent, then it's not conservative. Um, but if something's necessarily true, that implies that it's both true and conservative, but you can have this conservativeness without it being true. So here's a, here's a quote from, from Hartree. Um, Standard mathematics might turn out to be conservative, for it might conceivably turn out to be inconsistent. Sorry, standard mathematics might turn out not to be conservative, 
for it might conceivably turn out to be inconsistent. And if it's inconsistent, it certainly isn't conservative. We would, have, however, regard a proof that standard mathematics was inconsistent as extremely surprising and as showing that standard mathematics needed revision. Equally, it would be extremely surprising if, we, if it were to be discovered that standard mathematics implied that there are at least 106 non-mathematical objects in the universe or that the Paris Commune was defeated. And were such a discovery to be made, all but the most unregenerate rationalists would take this as showing that standard mathematics needed revision. Good mathematics is conservative. A discovery that accepted mathematics isn't conservative would be a discovery that it isn't good. So Field provides a couple of proofs of conservativeness. Um, there's some interesting questions about the relationship between conservativeness and explanation, um, which I'll just make some brief comments in passing on that. So there is there was a lot of debate in the 80s, I think, about the conservativeness proofs. Um, in one of the proofs, it was a set theoretic proof, if I recall correctly, Hartree, and the criticism was that you, you of all people, are not entitled to be using set theory in your proofs of conservativeness. Hartree's response, which I think is right, is the pro that's to misunderstand the project. The project is show that it's possible to be anomalist in this fashion and to show that by their own lights, using the resources that a Platonist is, has at their disposal, which includes set theory, you can show that mathematics would be conservative by the Platonist's own lights. So understanding the, the dialectic here, I think, that was a legitimate move, but there are provided several proofs of the conservativeness of mathematics. But a lot of people, um, me at times included, uh, although I have some doubts now, but various times, I think the, this, this quote from Hartree suggesting that even if we don't have a proof of the conservative of mathematics, it's something that we would desire. And if mathematics were not conservative, that would be a reason to change mathematics. So we have a good, re the reason we believe that it's conservative, similar to the reasons we believe that it's consistent, right? We uh, don't have a proof of the consistency of mathematics. Indeed, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem will tell us that we can't have that. But still, we believe that it's consistent because, you know, if it weren't, we'll fix it. And if any inconsistencies come to light, as they did in the in the, the turn of the 20th century with the paradoxes of set theory, we'll set about fixing them. And this seems like a reasonably good argument for the conservatives of mathematics. Either it is conservative now and we're good, or it's not, but when we discover that it's not, we'll fix it. Um, but as I said, I, just to raise a couple of questions about this, um, some interesting questions about the relationship between, between conservativeness and explanation. So it would be surprising if mathematics implied that there were two antipodal points on the Earth's surface with exactly the same temperature and pressure. But it does, right? This is one of my favorite examples of a mathematical explanation. Uh, it's a borsak Olam theorem of topology, algebraic topology, tells us that there will be two points on the Earth's surface, um, antipodal points, with exactly the same temperature and pressure. That's surprising, but there's not a reason to, to fix the mathematics here. What it tells us, I think at least, is that whatever's going on with the weather patterns is in some sense irrelevant to this. This is a big, broad, structural, topological feature of any system that has, um, you know, is is topologically equivalent to a sphere, and has continuous functions like a temperature and a pressure function defined on the surface of that that manifold, and it's got nothing to do with weather patterns. So when you discover that there are two antipodal points on the Earth's surface that have exactly the same temperature and pressure. You could explain that in terms of cold, local cold fronts and low pressure systems and El Nino, whatever you like. And that's all going to be right. That will be the reason for those particular two points. 
but why there are two points at all is a is the my count of this at least the reason there are two points at all is because of topology so the mathematics does tell you something rather surprising so is that a demonstration of the non conservative of mathematics N not quite it, it's it, mathematics can't prove meteorological claims without an interpretation of the mathematics in question and some assumptions about the topological properties of the earth and temperature and pressure functions. So mathematics doesn't tell you on its own that there will be these two points, even though I think I might even say that at some point, um, that's not right. You need the interpretation of the mathematics and it needs to have this, um, a, a little bit of meteorology in there to start with. But it, it does put some pressure on this notion of conservativeness that is that mathematics does sometimes shoulder the, the burden of the explanatory load in telling us things about the empirical world, like these topological fu uh, functions, um, topological properties uh, on the earth. Um, pass, just a passing comment. Back to science without numbers then. So what we've got to so far is, if you want to be anomalous of this stripe, you need to show how to do science without numbers. That's the hard road to take a serious scientific theory like Newtonian mechanics, the differential fragment of it at least, and show that uh, how you can go about doing that without invoking mathematical tools. That doesn't finish, that doesn't seal the deal though. You also need to be able to give an account of why mathematics can be used, even though it's a fiction, it's a useful fiction according to um, Hartree and other fictionalists. But if you're going to be a fictionalist, you need to then say why continuing to use the fiction is a legitimate thing to do and why it turns out to be useful. And that story is handled by the conservativeness. Okay. And, and I just comment on this in general, when someone says I'm a fictionalist about this, that, and the other, and I, I think most of us are fictionalist about something or other, you know, whether it be modality, whether it be, aesthetic qualities, whether it be moral properties, whatever. Many people are fictionalist about these things. Unless you're going to say, okay, I'm a fictionalist about that. And it is fiction. And you should stop talking in those terms. Right? But most fictionalists want the cake and eat it too, right? We're not, when I'm a fictionist about the things I'm a fictionist about, I want to be able to say, it's a useful fiction. And so we can continue using it. Right? And that's also important part of Hartree's project. He doesn't want to say we should stop teaching Newtonian physics in the usual way and teach it via science without numbers, right? Once you've proven the representation theorems and you've got the conservativeness proofs, then it's business as usual, right? You can do Newtonian mechanics in the usual way. Just the philosophical point is you don't need the mathematics in you know, in the, the philosophical sense for the philosophers of mathematics, you don't, the mathematics is no longer indispensable. So we don't need to be a realist about it. But it's not a claim that we ought to, what um, Gideon Rosen and John Burgess call a revolutionary nominalist here, where you, we need to revise the way we do science. That's not the claim. But most fictionalists in any, in any domain are of the view that the fiction that whether it be modality or moral properties or whatever, they're fictionalists and they think that it's a useful fiction so we can continue talking in that way. But one of the things that strikes me about the Hartree Field Project, and I think that he recognizes that you can't just say that, you've got to actually demonstrate why it's not dangerous to continue talking in this way. And Hartree does this by looking at the notion of conservativeness. Now, of course, if you want to be a, fictionalist about aesthetic qualities. I'm not sure what a conservativeness proof of aesthetic qualities would even look like, right? But you've got to at least gesture in that direction. You need to say something about why aesthetic qualities, even though they're fictions, if you're a fictionalist about these things, why they're fictions, but it's useful to talk in those terms. Why doesn't it do damage to the discipline of aesthetic aesthetics if you're a, you know, you're a fictionist about the core notions here? So 
With that in place, I think that's the core of the project. I don't think I've missed anything. That's a very brief overview of the Science Without Numbers project. So let's move to some criticisms and some of the subsequent commentary on this. Again, um, you'll hear much more about this in the, in the other talks, uh, uh, but the account uses nominalistically questionable entities such as space-time points. I think is the point that Mike Resnick and others have raised. So if you really a card carrying nominalist, you should be concerned about quantification over space time points. And that's crucial to the, the this, both the Hilbert uh, axiomatization of Euclidean geometry and the Hartree field axiomatization um, of, of Newtonian mechanics with these relational properties, relational properties between points, but you've got to have the points. So there's a it's sometimes said, I think this is a little unkind, but the idea, you know, the, the, the criticism goes something like this. Well, you've replaced, space, you've replaced the real numbers with something that's isomorphic to the real numbers uh, for space instead of uh, for the mathematical structure. Um, and if you're an anomalous, you should be worried about space-time points, but he doesn't dispense with space-time points. But again, to I'll let Hartree defend himself with some of these, but to say a word in defense here, that's to, to put nominalism as the primary motivation here. The, the quest for intrinsic explanations here is, is, if not more important, but at least just as important here. And so giving it a, a theory that talks about what's going on in terms of relational properties of the points, that delivers the intrinsic explanations. So maybe it's not the kind of nominalism that some nominalists would like because it's committed to space-time points, but it has this great virtue of offering intrinsic explanations, or so it's claimed. I I'm, I'm, won't enter into that debate here. There are various technical problems that various people have raised uh, along the way, such as the logical resources used, for instance, primitive modal operators and the like. Um, a criticism that came up very early and I, I still find really interesting is a criticism due to David Malamud, I think was the first to raise this in a review of Science Without Numbers in 1982, I think. It's not clear how to extend the account beyond space-time theories. So the, 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 the basic trick that Hilbert uses and that Hartree uses in his program is when you've got a space-time theory, you can be realist about the entities in the space-time, the points in the space-time, and then you can talk about relational properties, whether they be gravitational potential properties or distance properties or whatever. You can talk about those things that you need by comparing the points. So it's a relational theory of the points, but you've got to have the space-time. And if you're a realist about you know, your scientific theory, then it doesn't seem to be unreasonable unre to be a realist about the space-time. As Mike Resnick points out, realist about the space-time points is another thing, but at least you can be a realist about the space-time. But what if the underlying theory is not like that? And this is the point that, as I said, David Malamut raises. What if the theory has as its underlying space something different? So for instance, he gives the example of a Hamiltonian formulation of a classical theory, where the underlying space there is something like um, for, well, a, a phase space, right? Which is uh, a space of potential con uh, states the system could be in. So they're possibilia. And that doesn't seem to be something that a, a, a nominalist could be realist about. So if your underlying space is something that is not something you could reasonably be realist about, like a phase space, then not to say that this won't work, but rather it's not clear how you, this particular uh, path that Hartree has mapped out would help us in a Hamiltonian formulation of a classical theory. And then Malamut goes on and says, well, what about worse still, perhaps quantum mechanics where the underlying spaces are Hilbert spaces. And a great deal of attention then focused on quantum mechanics. Um, in a way as though 
Hartree had shown how to anomalize an old classical theory, but we need to be able to anomalize quantum mechanics. But the point of Malamut's objection, I think, is very general. It's not just about classical versus modern theories, but rather any theory that doesn't have a space-time structure as its underlying space. So uh, Hamiltonian formulations of, of, of any classical theory he mentions explicitly as being problematic, problematic in the sense not as this can't be done, but rather we haven't had any guidance on this thus far. Um, still questions about whether the normalized theory that Hartree provides in Science Without Numbers is better by ordinary standards of scientific theory choice. I think he does give us some reasons to think that it's better. It's, uh, it's uh, more parsimonious to start with. That's a, you know, all, all nominalists get to claim that one, right? Um, your theory is more parsimonious because it doesn't have mathematical entities in it. But Hartree goes on, again, getting back to this intrinsic explanation. And again, Eddie will be talking more about this tomorrow. But Hartree claims an advantage here in that the theories have intrinsic explanation rather than committing to these extrinsic explanations. And that's an advantage by normal scientific theory choice. But there's a lot more to say about that. Can they offer the same explanations, for instance, in general? Are there explanations that are available in the mathematized theory that are not available in the normalized theory. I, I've made a big song and dance about that over the years, claiming that mathematized theories have greater explanatory power and so on. You know, take that as you will. But there are there's there's a lot more to say about how you go measuring the advantages of one scientific theory over another. But again, I don't think it's fair to think of Hartree just showing us how to normalize science and leaving it at that. He doesn't make a case for why. Um, the normalized version is a preferable theory. Um, I think I've covered most of that. Virtues of the count, I'll try and wind things up. Um, how much longer have I got, Eddie? I'm... Actually, we're just about out of time, but... Uh... Okay, so let me just say a couple of things about the virtues of the theory and then I'll finish up. So the virtues, I think, are, are, are advertised, as advertised, ontologically more parsimonious than Platonism, no epistemic problems because it's not a Platonist theory. Arbitrariness of coordinate systems are eliminated. Explanations are intrinsic in the sense that numbers are not needed and facts about, for example, space-time points are spelled out in terms of relations on space-time uh, points. It's all about the space-time points themselves, not about the mathematical structures. Um, but if this normalistic theory delivers intrinsic explanations and these are preferable, um, are there other virtues offered by mathematical versions of the theories? As I just said, I think that's an open question and it's currently being hotly debated. Um, in particular, could mathematics help facilitate or more radically provide explanations of physical phenomena? And the, this question about Field's program, I think, gave rise to the debates about the existence of mathematical explanations. And, you know, uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> I'll trace that one back to Hartree as well. So I think it's the gold standard for what fictionalists about any domain need to do. As I mentioned passing, I think if you're a fictionalist about anything, you actually need to something like conservativeness and you need to give some argument about why the fiction is in fact useful. I think it's an interesting project in its own right, irrespective of what you think about realism and anti-realism. It's just a really, really interesting uh, technical exercise in its own right. And I think it's still think it's the most promising route to nominalism for what it's worth. Um, it contains great philosophy. It's a great exemplar of how philosophy should be done. Honest, rigorous, always interesting. And finally, it provides at least one impetus for thinking about the role of mathematics in scientific explanations. Um, you might want to not list that amongst the virtues of the book, but I do. <laughs> that's one of the, that's where I got interested in mathematical explanations is from this work of Hartree Fields very early on. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I hope that gives you some idea of the, the richness and some of the core ideas of science without numbers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That was super interesting and very helpful. Um, Hartree, would you like to uh, respond briefly? There's also time in the end, but if you'd like to respond anything to uh, Mark's talk, this will be a good time. Hartree, uh, let me see, I'm here. Oh, 
Uh, Hartree, you're muted. Oh yeah. Um, okay, got it. Um, okay, maybe I sh should just make like three uh, 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 brief remarks. Uh, one is on, on, on conservativeness. Um, so a lot of people complained at the time that my use of the term was not, uh, uh, well, there were various uh, connected problems about my use of the term. I, it, it seemed like I uh, um, was using it in a way that didn't properly take a brutal theorem in, in, in to account. Um, and, and so anyway, some of the uh, complaints were, uh, uh, were, were uh, pretty much uh, correct. Um, I think um, uh, they didn't really cut against the uh, spirit of what I was doing. And I think you have uh, properly emphasized the uh, spirit of what I was doing. Um, so uh, uh, this isn't a complaint about what you said. I just, um, uh, I, I, I guess it's a note that if there are some, some complaints along technical lines, I, I uh, do acknowledge them there. I talked about it at considerable length in the second edition of the book. Um, uh, I wanted to say something brief about uh, your e example of the Borsak uh, uh, theorem. Um, and that is that I don't really see that this is a case for the explanatory uh, um, power of the math because the um, so the, the uh, continuity of the uh, pressure and temperature functions can be put in uh, anomalistic terms, uh, and and I uh, do so in the book. And the fact that the Earth is uh, convex and uh, topologically equivalent to the sphere. Uh, could also be put in, in such terms. So it is a surprising result, but the surprising result is that such uh, meager nominalistic assumptions Im imply it. Uh, they do. Um, basically, what's right about the conservativeness of math uh, shows that they do. Um, so I don't, I don't see that uh, uh, this is a case for the explanatory uh, power of the math as opposed to the nonalistic theory. Um, and a final point. Uh, um, so. Um, so what you um, uh, uh, say about the Hamiltonian formulations of Newtonian mechanics is interesting. And I don't actually have a, a settled view about this. Um, at the time I wrote Science Without Numbers, I thought that even independent of nominalism, one should think of the Hamiltonian form, formulation as, as uh, not really basic, that it, in some sense, you can really only understand the Hamiltonian formulation if you all, all already understand the uh, ordinary formulation. Uh, and I guess I still, to some extent, uh, think that. I mean, I, 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 I do agree that the, there is some sense in which the Hamiltonian formulation um, seems explanatory in that it, it provides a framework in which a, a number of different theories can be 
fit more easily and compared. Uh, and that is an aspect of what we normally think of is e e explanatoryness. Um, so I, I guess I, I would like to actually see the different aspects of the notion of e explanatoryness uh, sort of um, uh, un unpacked and separated from each other and, um, uh, and a, 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 a discussion had about um, which of the senses are most relevant to choice of theory as literal truth. Um, uh, so I'm not sure what the upshot of this would be, uh, but I, I think it's an in, in interesting question that uh, needs further discussion. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much, Hartree. I see three hands, uh, but Mark, would you like to respond or should I just go to questions? Uh, I just, just on that last point, I, I agree with you, Hartree. I mean, we should, I should have mentioned in passing that there are theorems to the effect that under you know, perfectly reasonable conditions that the Hamiltonian formulation and Lagrange formulations of these clearies, are, they're, they're intertranslatable, right? So there's a, there's a sense in which Hamiltonian formulations can always be reduced to sta standard Lagrangian formulations, right? And that's what Hartree was thinking, right? That the, the Lagrange formulation is oh, more so, basic. Oh, well, actually, the the Lagrange formulation raises the same issues. It's on configuration space, uh, not on ordinary space. Right. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. So. The, but the, the issue is whether you get something new by these different formulations. And given the translations of from one to the other, question is, well, you can take the one that I've already normalized, that's the one the, that, that, and they all reduce to that. But the question of explanation arises, arises here as well. You know, is it that you can get some explanation out of the Hamiltonian formulation that you can't get out of the others? Or maybe just that it's more transparent in the Hamiltonian formulation. I think these are all interesting questions and lead us back to, you know, we do need a clearer idea of what explanation is in science generally, but I think particularly when we're looking at um, these so-called mathematical explanations. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Hartree. So we're almost out of time for this session, but I can take maybe one or two questions and the remaining question is uh, say for an open discussion. So the first one goes to Ian, and the second one is Tim. Oh, Ian, you are still um, uh, you're still muted. Let me unmute you. Okay, you're down. Good. Oh, sorry, mute again. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I just want to comment, and there's a sort of a question at the end of it. When I was a theoretical physicist, people would show me other theoretical physicists would show me vast quantities of wonderful mathematics. And when I asked them, yes, but what things do you believe in? A lot of them looked very shocked. And I, it seemed to be that theoretical physics was the opposite of Hartree's program, science without ontology. You just run on maths uh, and, and uh, you think that, you know, ontology was some sort of very primitive thing that we did before maths. So I just wonder if you would comment, why do you think there is this, this big divide between working theoretical physicists who actually, when, when nobody's looking, have a private ontology, but they won't necessarily admit that. Why do you think there is this big uh, divide um, good question, and that's that's a kind of sociology of science question that I'm neither qualified <laughs> nor, nor equipped to answer. But let me, you know, speculate. I, I think a lot of science proceeds in in a, in a adventurous kind of tone, right? So why do scientists worry about vacuum solutions to Einstein's equations, right? We know we don't live in one of those universes, but you know, just well, what if we did just exploring theoretical physics? So I think it's it's um, can be restrictive to science to think 
have I got to defend, provide a metaphysically good argument that will stand up to philosophical scrutiny for every object I posit in my theory, that's kind of crippling to science. So let the metaphysics fall where it may, let's just explore the science. It doesn't sound like a bad idea to me. And I, whether that's what they're doing, as I said, that's sociology, this is a priori sociology of science that I should, but I, I suspect that there is a, a little bit of that. Just don't think about the metaphysics, leave that for others, uh, just explore the science. Um, been, it's been reasonably successful so far. So yeah, I, I don't know, maybe others have ideas. Uh, Tim? Uh, okay, I, I have a, a just a real short um, terminological comment and then a very sharp question about dialectic. Uh, the terminological comment is somewhere in the middle, science without numbers became science without mathematics. And I would just like to um, at least raise an objection. That there's a whole lot of mathematics that isn't about numbers. And I think you can have worries about numbers that are not worries about mathematics in general. But um, I, I don't understand the dialectical situation. So you prove a representation theorem using a whole bunch of high powered math or set theory or logic or whatever the heck you're using to prove it. And then you say, oh, but as a nominalist, you're not allowed that. And you say, no, 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 dialectically, if you're a Platonist, you're allowed it. So this is a way to convince Platonists that they can do what? Well, they can continue using math and pretend to be nominalists, I guess. But again, the end game was you can keep doing, you know, Newtonian mechanics in the same way using integrals and everything else. But then from the nominalist point of view, the nominalist can't accept any of that stuff, at least not obviously. So what you seem to have proven is that a Platonist can pretend to be a nominalist and a nominalist is up the creek. So I don't get, I don't get what's going on. Um, do you want me to defend you here, Hartree, or would you like to defend yourself? <laughs> uh, I'll be my guest and I might add something afterwards. Okay. I, I, again, I think the, the project was, as Hartree puts it, I think very clearly in the second edition, it's a defense of nominalism. So it's to show that this position is, is a plausible position. It's not a positive argument for nominalists, as in why you should be a nomalist, but rather here's a, here's a way to be a nominalist that stands up. Now, one part of that project, I take it, would be to show that if you're at start, let's suppose you start out as a Platonist, by your own lights, you could be a nominalist, right? Now, it's, I, I take your point, Tim, there is a sort of instability then that once you get to being a nominalist, you want a defense of the nominalism, why is it that I'm a nominalist? And the, the ladder that I used to get here has been kicked away. It's a, it's an old Wittgensteinian kind of puzzle, right? And uh, yeah, and, I, and I, t I take the point, but I think that the, the, the project itself is about to show that you can start out with this Quinean metaphysics, Platonist through and through by, you know, by a standard way of looking at it. And here's a way of leading you, leading one to nominalism. Defending it once you get there, I think that's another story. And I don't, I don't think that the, um, that's part of the Science Without Numbers project, but I, I, maybe there's something I've missed there. You got some, you want to add to that, Hartree? Um. Uh, well, let me think. Um, I, 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 I think I, I'm not actually thinking of exactly what the best thing to say here is. But uh, uh, let me make two points. Uh, one is that um, so in 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 later work, I did address the question of of how you might do a, a meta logic in a in a in a, a nominalist fashion, using a, a using a a, a, a notion of uh, of uh, a logical modality here, um, and 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 I think this is uh, relevant to answering the uh, question. Um, and, and and the other thing I want to say is that that it it um, it was part of the view sort of in in implicit in the conservative and stuff that that um, uh, 
Platonist reasoning doesn't get you into trouble. So the idea is that um, you could, in principle, though it would be extremely difficult, to work with a, a nonalistic theory and deduce uh, consequences um, from it. Um, uh, of course, uh, it 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 would be a, a practical possibility. Um, and um, so we have a Platonistic proof that you don't get into a, 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 a trouble using the map, but uh, it it seems like a pre theoretically natural view that uh, that you don't get into uh, trouble. And so if you can prove it by Platonistic lights, then um, it seemed sort of plausible to believe it, even if even if you don't have the Platonist proof. Uh, uh, but as I I said, the normalization of uh, metalogic might actually uh, supply you with a non-Platonist proof, though though uh, using modality. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so that ended our first session of the day, and we'll come to Professor Mary Long's session in five minutes at, uh, let me see what time is it now in New York. So we're